So good day to one and all. So welcome to another session on the various topics in general surgery. So the topic that we'll be discussing about today is pretty dry to say the least. But nevertheless, it is as important as any topic in the surgical specialty. Nutrition carries great importance not only as a surgeon, but as a basic medical professional, but it carries even more importance as a surgeon. So today we'll be discussing about nutrition in surgery. So the nutritional status, as I said earlier, is an important determinant of outcome post-surgery. So no matter how good the surgeon is, the outcome of surgery is dependent to a large extent on the nutritional status of the patient. It is interesting to note that more than 50 percentage of patients or adult patients who come to a surgical ward are malnourished in some form or the other. It can be mild, moderate or severe malnourishment. And assessment of nutrition status of a patient prior to taking him up or him or her up for surgery is key point in the management of uh, condition that the patient has. It needs to be remembered that the nutritional needs of a person who is injured or a person who is morbid is much different when compared to a healthy individual. So as a surgeon, our aim here is to identify in a timely manner, the need for nutritional support and to meet the requirements through the best route possible with less complications. So before we go on to what we need to do in a child or in a person who is malnourished, it is very important that we know about the basic physiology of what happens during starvation. So a person who has not eaten for less than 12 hours, the majority of the food that he had eaten during the last meal is now become digested by 12 hours. So the insulin and glucagon levels start rising up. The child person has a decrease in insulin levels and glucagon levels rise up. So subsequently what happens is that the glycogen within the liver is converted into glucose by a process called glycogenolysis. So why is it converted into glucose? It is because during the initial phases of starvation, various important structures in the body, for example like the brain, the, w, uh, the WBCs, the red blood cells and the renal medulla depend only upon glucose during the initial periods for, to, for their energy requirements. So hence this conversion of glucose, glycogen to glucose occurs. So not only is glycogen present in the liver, it is present in the skeletal muscles as well. So skeletal muscles contain about 500 grams of glycogen in a normal healthy adult. So this conversion of glycogen in the skeletal muscle to glucose is different from that of hepatic glycogenolysis. So how is it different from hepatic or the glycogen breakdown that occurs in liver? It is because in the skeletal muscle, even though breakdown of glycogen can occur, it cannot be converted into glucose within the muscle. It has to be shifted, brought to the liver and from there it has to be produced. So this cycle is called Cori's cycle, wherein the muscle glycogen is broken down and you have lactate production. This lactate is taken to the liver and in the liver you have production of glucose. So this is Cori's cycle. A very important point to be remembered regarding Cori's cycle is that it is an energy dependent process. So for Cori's cycle to occur, energy in the form of ATP is required. So it does not give energy, but in turn, it consumes energy to produce glucose. So that is how muscle glycogen is different from liver glycogen. So liver glycogen, like I said earlier, just does not need to be transported anywhere. In the liver itself, the glycogen breaks down, forms glucose. Whereas in the skeletal muscle, the glycogen has to be broken down and be, should be converted into glucose in the liver. So it has to be transported to the liver. And this process is called Cori cycle which is an energy dependent process. Now, what happens if a person is starving for more than 24 hours? So the glycogen reserves all get depleted and the body starts looking for alternative sources of glucose. So it starts to produce more glucose. So this production of glucose is what is called as gluconeogenesis or de novo production of glucose. So this de novo production of glucose occurs within the liver. So for glucose production, there are different substrates that are required and the most important substrate is amino acid. So amino acids are mainly two in nature. One is glutamine and alanine and their sources can be varied. 
So approximately 400 kilocalories of exogenous glucose is required to prevent muscle breakdown. In short, if you administer a person 400 kilocalories of exogenous glucose, you might be able to prevent muscle breakdown because that is the most important source for amino acids which are being used as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. So once the amino acids start getting used, what happens subsequently is that the fat within the body starts breaking down. So this breakdown of fat into glycerol and fatty acid. So glycerol here gets converted into glucose and takes part in gluconeogenesis. And the fatty acids again, they are these this glycerol can also be used as a fuel for energy production. And this fatty acid subsequently enters into ketogenesis, forms ketone bodies in the liver and these are dependent upon insulin basically because of insulin deficiency. After two to three weeks, what happens is that the CNS now starts using ketone bodies as a primary source of energy. And if this process proceeds further, the energy requirement in an adult falls to about 15 to 20 kilocalories per kilogram body weight per day because of reduced peripheral conversion of T4 to T3.